Do you remember the first time you ever laid your eyes on Grand Theft Auto 3? What about the first time you actually drove through the streets of Liberty City yourself, experiencing the sights and sounds of everything this world had to offer? How did you find out about the cheats? All weapons and ammo, full health and armor, spot a tank... Man, the tank. Where were you? When was that? Grand Theft Auto 3 is immortal. It's a piece of art that changed an entire industry. And initially, the people making it had no idea what they had on their hands. From the initial concept stages to the struggles of structuring a world this large that wouldn't collapse on itself, we're about to dive into the blood and guts of it all. This is Six Stars in Liberty City, a Grand Theft Auto 3 retrospective. Every video here on 616 Entertainment is made possible by my supporters over on Patreon. If you enjoy the show here today, consider signing up. You'll get early access, exclusive videos and podcasts and more. Pro Wrestling Tees has the merch. As always, thank you for watching. Before we go any further, I would like to address up front that what you're seeing is indeed footage captured from the definitive edition of Grand Theft Auto 3. A decision I made for your sake, and your sake alone. Yes, I've played the original, many times in fact, but it simply hasn't aged well from a visual perspective. Here, here's some PlayStation 2 footage I captured. To be fair, GTA 3 looked great for its time but it's a game that looks better in our memories than it does in reality. And to be even more fair, it looked better on our old CRT televisions of that bygone era. The definitive editions of the Grand Theft Auto trilogy launched in a very, very poor state a couple years back, but I can assure you, they're in a much better place now. And I believe using this as our visual representation is better for you, the viewer. Now, if that's a major hang-up for you, that's your call, and I'll see you later. But if you're still here, let's get down to business. And fuck those other guys, right? I'm just kidding. In October of 2001, I was 10, almost 11 years old. Despite the console releasing a year ago, I didn't have a PlayStation 2 of my own yet, so there I was, sitting in a teal, faux leather beanbag chair on the floor in my bedroom, most likely playing WWF Smackdown 2 Know Your Role on my PS1. When I realized it was 7 o'clock, I did what any well-adjusted individual would do in 2001. I shut off my Smackdown video game, grabbed my wrestling action figures, and parked my ass in front of the TV in the living room, turning the channel to the newest episode of WWF Smackdown. It was a sickness, I'm telling you. The whole wrestling thing, it was out of control. I've painted this picture to answer the question I posed to you at the top of this video. That question being, do you remember the first time you laid your eyes on Grand Theft Auto 3? For me, this was it. A commercial break during SmackDown. I couldn't believe when I scrolled down and saw the top comment on this video. I don't know who this guy is, but in this SmackDown plus GTA way, we're linked. Seeing this dude in a sick leather jacket run across the tracks with a train barreling down on him, the car speeding around and launching through the air, the flamethrower, I was sold. Now obviously whether I was sold or not didn't make a difference as I didn't have a PS2, as you know. But this was awesome nonetheless. And I knew one thing, I had to play it. And that was the feeling not just from me, but from millions of others. Millions and billions, as a matter of fact. And play it, I would. Look, I know you didn't come here for the history of Ian eventually gets a PS2, so we'll cut to the chase, that's fine. I played the absolute shit out of GTA 3 with my brother, with my friends, man. This was a staple during sleepovers. We'd punch in cheats and go on what we would call rampages. Kill as many people as possible, stay alive as long as possible, rack that wanted level up to six stars, and good luck.
Now, if this sounds horrible, if this sounds like it's setting a bad example for anybody who might possibly suffer the misfortune of getting their hands on a controller, suck it. Grow up. Yeah, it was all over the news. Grand Theft Auto is terrible for kids. It's a horrendous influence on all mankind. Shut up. It's the same deal as growing up playing Mortal Kombat when I was like five years old. My dad told us, this is a game. You're going to see things in the game that aren't real. And if I see you doing Mortal Kombat or wrestling moves anywhere but the game, we're going to have a problem. Capiche? It's that simple. Parent your children. Get a brain in your head. Take responsibility for your own actions. Anyway, yeah, rampages are where most of our time would be spent. I would start the story mode here or there, but I'd usually only play far enough that the game would leave me alone and then I could just wreak havoc on my own. This meant that, for years, I experienced about a third of Liberty City, as much of the map is quarantined off until you progress the story to a certain point. Man, what was I doing? I mean, I know I was picking up prostitutes. That's a fact. You get them in the car, you take them to a secluded area, and you watch your health bar expand. At 12, 13 years old, this felt so forbidden. It felt so adult. What an innocent time that was. Okay, if you kill her and take your money back, you can't call it an innocent time anymore. Good lord. The Grand Theft Auto 3 we know and love. The Grand Theft Auto 3 you're seeing on screen right now. This isn't what the game was always meant to be. This was the franchise's first foray into the third dimension, after all. The original GTA looked like this. Its sequel offered much of the same. And initially, this third installment would have been similar. 2.5D, but with an isometric point of view, rather than full top-down. Obviously, the concept evolved into full 3D, but you might be having a little bit of deja vu. Maybe you're thinking, I don't know, I feel like I've seen the game you're describing. And you have. I talked about this with Last Stand Media's Colin Moriarty on a recent episode of Sacred Symbols Plus. Between GTA 2 and 3, there was a GTA 2.5 floating around, which was an isometric GTA set in Miami that most vis visually represented Sim City. The 2.5D thing, my first thought was, oh, that could have been really cool. And I'm thinking like, why did they never revisit that? Because I love the idea. And then the more I thought of it, I was like, I mean, that's kind of Chinatown Wars. That's exactly Wars. what I was gonna say. Is, yeah, Chinatown Wars is yeah. kind, of, kind of that. 2009's Grand Theft Auto Chinatown Wars on the Nintendo DS is essentially what the original pitch for Grand Theft Auto 3 entailed. There was this rat-a-tat at the door. I was in bed, it was like noon. And there was this fucking, almost like, why, why, all right, so it ultimately ends up being a FedEx guy, but why do they have to knock like cops, right? Oh yeah, and, they need you to come to the door Yeah, now. it's like, holy shit, dude. So anyway, I had two of these. Many players know that the GTA games are developed by Rockstar, one of the biggest and most successful studios in the history of the industry. But like EA Sports, Rockstar isn't just one team. As a subsidiary of Take-Two Interactive, Rockstar itself is an umbrella with several unique studios under its banner. Rockstar Leeds developed the aforementioned Chinatown Wars and Liberty City Stories for handhelds. Rockstar London were the team behind Manhunt 2. Rockstar San Diego are the home of the Red Dead series, so on and so forth. The developers who brought the Grand Theft Auto franchise to life were once called DMA Design. And if you played Body Harvest on the Nintendo 64 or Uniracers on Super Nintendo, hey man, these are Rockstar North games, believe it or not. What I didn't know for a long time, honestly, was that Grand Theft Auto 3 wasn't initially being designed with the PlayStation 2 in mind. The original home for the game was the Sega Dreamcast. This is one of those things that's fun to think about, right? How would the industry be different if Grand Theft Auto and Sega formed the tag team that never was? I love these sorts of hypotheticals. Fun for Rockstar North was the main objective in development. Grand Theft Auto 3 needed to be fun to play. 
kinetic driving, high stakes thrills, and a whole closet full of weapons with which the player could raise hell. I think it goes without saying, they nailed it. The story mode, which goes way deeper than I ever thought it did when I was younger, was a distant second, and it shows. I just recently played through this entire game once again. It was my first full run as an adult, really soaking it in as I went from mission to mission, and I found the experience to be super disjointed. I'd be working with Salvatore, driving his wife Maria around to clubs and parties and whatnot, and the next thing I know, Salvatore wants me dead. Maria says, I told him we're an item, as if she's cheating on Sal with me, and I'm like, when did that happen? I didn't skip anything. I'm not banging Maria. I'm pretty sure I would remember that. This is where the concept of fun being the main focus comes into play. Obi Vermeij, a former Rockstar employee whose tell-all blog was shut down after the company told him to stop sharing his stories, made it clear that many of the missions were thrown around from place to place, handed to the player from any number of characters, some of which die at certain points in the game. So it's easy to see why the order and events might come off a little disconnected or confusing. The entire plot of our main character's girlfriend trying to kill him in the opening cutscene? This whole thing was added at the last second. How do you like that? If you're not into the story mode or going on rampages, nerd, there's plenty more for you to do here in Liberty City. Maybe you're a driver at heart. You want to get the citizens where they need to go. Hop in a taxi cab and make it happen. Even if you're not the one shooting innocents in the streets, they're gonna wind up shot. Driving an ambulance offers an EMT minigame. Commandeer a police cruiser to execute vigilante missions. And I do mean execute. Man, that's true to life, huh? There are races, firefighter missions. Look, I'm telling you, there's a ton to spend your time on. Ammunition shops allow you to pop in and purchase new weapons and ammo. There are 100 hidden packages strewn about the city. And the Easter eggs. My god, the Easter eggs. Classic. Gamers eventually turn their attention to the weirdest shit imaginable. Somebody figured out that shooting the moon with a sniper rifle actually changes the size of the damn thing. Our dude Obi, who I mentioned earlier, revealed that he was the man behind this easter egg, and it wasn't intended to be a cute little secret at all. There was an ongoing debate in the Rockstar North offices over the size of the moon. Should it be some massive Tim Burton light in the sky, or should it have a smaller, more reasonable, more realistic look? The debate raged on and Obi created a tool to change the size on command. This tool was the sniper rifle. Time went on, the game went gold, it even hit store shelves, and no one ever decided on which moon should be used in the game. So go grab your copy of GTA 3, shoot the moon with a sniper rifle, and you'll change its size. Congratulations, you are working with a developer's shortcut tool. And that's just one example of the sort of black magic that went into the creation of this game. Have you ever noticed that there are only a few types of cars available at any given time? There are dozens of vehicle types in the game, but looking around it's like, these are all kind of the same thing. If you've ever wanted an army truck and you can't find any, eventually you grab one and now they're all over the place, where were you five seconds ago? You're not crazy, you're perceptive. The PlayStation 2, as powerful as it was at the time, could only handle so much. The game is showing you so many of the same vehicles moment to moment because it literally can't handle showing you every card in the deck at the same time. The leash tightens further and further the higher your wanted level rises because the game now has to factor in extra police cars, the police trucks, the FBI cruisers, so on and so forth. Try looking around at that point and see how many different cars there are on the street. You can count them on one hand. I feel like it's worth mentioning that back in 2001, I'd never played anything like Grand Theft Auto 3 before. My favorite video game of all time is Resident Evil from 1996. The Spencer Mansion is one of the greatest settings in video game history, for my money. 
But this is really just a big ass house. Factor in the lab or the guard house and the look and feel changes a bit, but things are fairly contained. Fast forward a little bit, another favorite of mine is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, which is a series I'm trying to do a retrospective on. Sign up over on Patreon and we will unlock this goal. And it's what you might expect, level by level, goal by goal. What I'm getting at, obviously, is the sheer size and scope of Liberty City. Grand Theft Auto 3's approach to the concept of an open world changed the entire industry. The term sandbox game didn't exist prior to its release, and for good reason. Sure, one could argue titles like The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time or Super Mario 64 technically exhibit elements of an open world several years prior, but neither of them offer the variety of GTA 3. Running around on foot, driving cars, cutting through the waves and boats, Highways that connect the boroughs, come on. I'm not gonna pull out one of the most overused terms in video game coverage, you know, the living, breathing world, because that's a stretch. This was 2001 after all, and there was still plenty of evolution to come from this, but let's be real, nobody had shit on Liberty City. Grand Theft Auto 3 is the godfather of the open world sandbox. Even if the story is a little confusing, and it is, it's certainly interesting. All of these loudmouth mobsters are the perfect opposite for our character, who never says a word throughout the entire game. Hell, he doesn't even have a name until Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, but that's a bridge we'll cross once we get there. Our nameless, voiceless protagonist is often disrespected and talked down to by these characters. And the voices that deliver these lines are familiar ones. Don Salvatore was played by Frank Vincent, aka Phil Leotardo from The Sopranos. They must be making spank on that big boat that Curly led you to. Tony Cipriani is Michael Madsen. It's on a timer, so if you mess up, there'll be no evidence. Luigi is voiced by Joe Pantoliano. Some Diablo scumbag has been pimping his scuzzy bitches in my backyard. Go and take care of things for me. Detective Ray is Robert Loggia. Touch that place. That's it. Flush them out and you hunt them down. These are stars. Stars with recognizable voices. And these performances made the game feel huge. In that same vein, I'd point to the radio stations, which not only feature real life licensed music, but come complete with fully original talk shows and commercials as well. It's a shame I can't play any of the music or anything for you. This is YouTube and that's Copyright City. But this video could not be made without mentioning the radio stations. An integral part of the experience. There's no doubt about it. I remember my dad recognizing Frank Vincent's voice and being drawn in. If you've heard my stories about my dad before, you know that he didn't play video games himself, but he'd often ask for the controller if something caught his eye as he walked through the room. Getting him a car he liked and letting him drive around Liberty City was always awesome to see, even if it usually ended with a flipped over vehicle exploding to bits. In fact, that probably made it better. Even for the game's many, many triumphs, it's certainly not without its flaws. And these aren't all necessarily flaws. Some of these are just things I don't like. But let's start with a legit flaw. The checkpoint system during story missions is garbage. Terrible. A story mission consists of an introductory cutscene. Usually you have to grab a car, drive somewhere, sometimes drive to multiple places, and then the action picks up. After a big firefight or a chase, the mission ends and you get paid. If you die at any point during the mission, it could be immediately or right before you're about to land that kill shot you go all the way back to the beginning of the mission. Watch the cutscene again, asshole. You fucked up. Drive all the way to the destination again, dickhead. You fucked up. Even calling it a checkpoint system is being too kind as it's really not a checkpoint system at all. Dying a few times on a mission that requires a ton of setup will have you turning off your PS2, I promise you. For something that just annoys me, this one's a double-edged sword. Is it cool that as the story progresses, certain gangs start to hate you through the city? 
Stepping foot in Chinatown will see the triads fire on you instantly. Is that cool? Yes. Kind of. It feels like my actions have consequences. But it would be nice if they would knock it off, too. <laughs> I'd like to be able to drive through Chinatown without being shot at for some shit that happened forever ago, you know? Give me a break. I may not love these little tidbits, but at least they made the final cut, right? And making the final cut, I mean, that's unlike GTA 3's online multiplayer, which was a real thing at one point and was cut for the sake of development time. Rockstar North was originally working on land functionality for GTA 3, this is, I think, amazing, and actually hired two people for Vice City specifically to get this functionality working in that game, but couldn't. As a result, San Andreas was given a co-op mode and online play was considered a higher priority. One of the craziest things I learned in my research was that Microsoft was initially offered full exclusivity for Grand Theft Auto 3. And they passed on the opportunity. Fast forward to the green brand also passing on the chance to have Spider-Man as an exclusive. And we can officially call these blunders a pattern now, Dan Dan's. But not all blunders are created equal. Upon GTA 3's initial E3 appearance, Rockstar thought they shit the bed. They didn't feel as though what they'd shown had garnered any significant interest in the final product. Once October 22nd, 2001 rolled around though, and they sold a billion copies in 24 hours- I'm just kidding. Grand Theft Auto 3 actually didn't sell all that well at first. It did fine enough, but it actually wasn't until the media began to run with how problematic the game was it really exploded and became the massive hit we know it as today. The reviews were fantastic, with critics, even at the time, recognizing the insanity of the game's scope. GTA 3 would capture dozens of Game of the Year honors and is still recognized as one of the most important video games ever made. Hey, you don't sell over 15 million copies for no reason, right? Grand Theft Auto 3 is a game I can come back to anytime. It's a game I love to drive around in. It's a game I love to commit atrocities in. And maybe above all else, it's a game that mentally puts me on my ass in front of the TV in the living room watching that newest episode of WWF SmackDown, action figures in hand. Some of you may have retired this game the second Vice City came out. Or maybe you held out until San Andreas dropped. But any way you slice it, Grand Theft Auto 3 might just be the skeleton of a perfect video game. Again, flashing back to that Sacred Symbols Plus episode I recorded with Colin Moriarty. I had begun playing it to just play something and I had finished it being like, God damn, is that game good? It ended up not being what I remembered. It ended up being so far deeper and much more high quality and much more um, influential than I really ever gave it credit for. GTA 3 is a game that'll catch your dad's eye. It's a game that your girlfriend wants to do a few rampages in, even if she doesn't normally play these types of games. GTA 3 is a game that will never, ever fade. And now here's a compilation of insanity for no good reason at all. There it is, Dan Dans, that's six stars in Liberty City, a Grand Theft Auto 3 retrospective. I was able to make this video because of the people who support me over on Patreon. We've already unlocked the GTA Vice City video and we're not far away from hitting the San Andreas goal. And we are really close, so it's literally you who could be the one to push us over the line. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.